Hi, everyone. Welcome to our live program today. So happy to have you join us. My name is Megan Cook, and I am the manager of education partnerships and programs for Ocean Exploration Trust and very proudly part of our core of exploration. This is our 13th in our series of Explore From Home live events. Today's program was developed in partnership with Sitco to inspire lifelong learners. Through this series and our other programming, we introduce you to our team of explorers and encourage you to pursue your interests and your passions in science, technology, engineering, math, and the many complementary passions and talents that it takes to put together a great team like our core of exploration. Whether you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube, we're really glad to have you be part of this event. And throughout the event, you'll be able to add your questions in. So you can send them in to the comment box below. By adding a comment, that question will come to us and we'll be able to answer your questions throughout the live program. If you're a student, watching in your classroom or in your learn from home space. We wanna know that you're here joining us too. So feel free to add student question or let us know um, where it is that you're watching and sharing this experience with us from. The team right now is in the midst of our 2020 expedition season and we've been so happy to bring you the last seven expeditions aboard our ship, Exploration Vessel Nautilus, streaming live to nautiluslive.org. Today, the team is mobilizing for another exciting expedition, looking at the seafloor just off the shore of one of America's biggest cities, Los Angeles, but still seeing things that we've never, ever seen before. Today's program is a special one, and I'm so glad that you're here to be part of it. Um, I get to introduce you to one of my role models and a great member of our team, Dr. Robert Ballard. He wears many hats. Uh, he's a professor of oceanography at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. He's an explorer at large at National Geographic Society, a research scholar from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He served in the Navy for 30 years as a pioneer in the development of deep sea submersibles and remotely operated vehicle systems. He's been part of 155 deep sea expeditions, including tracking down many very famous shipwrecks, including Titanic, Bismarck, Lost Fleet of Guadalcanal, Yorktown, uh, the list goes on. But nearest to my heart and to our hearts as explorers, Dr. Ballard is the founder and the president of Ocean Exploration Trust, which brings all of us the Nautilus expedition uh, season every single year and invites all of us down to the deep sea to be part of this mission. So Bob, thank you so much for being here with me today. Well, thank you, Megan, and hello to everyone out there. Uh, right now, I'm in my own little command center uh, that can go live at the flick of a switch. Uh, right now, as Megan said, the Nautilus is in port in uh, San Pedro. I grew up in California, but I've been living on the East Coast uh, quite some time after going into the United States Navy. My love affair with the ocean began at a very, very early age. But for me, I think it really brought home how important our little planet is. And the image that I like to show you is the earth rise, not the sunrise. I think one of the most amazing things that came out of the space program was yes, going to the moon and walking around on it, but was looking back and seeing this little blue marble in a black velvet void of nothingness. And all of a sudden, the infinity of outer space became very finite to me. This precious little marble that we live on and it's so important that we take care of this. As far as I'm concerned, there's no plan B for the human race. We must live in harmony with our planet. In fact, there's a new concept that's emerging within the sciences called the concept of Gaia. And the concept of Gaia says that the earth is actually a creature dependent upon life on its surface and vice versa. I know it's hard to think of Earth as a living creature, but one of the analogies I give is, think about being a, a mayfly that lives on, this, on, on a giant sequoia tree. Now, a mayfly lives only four, four days. And so imagine you were interviewing a mayfly and you said, do you perceive this object, this sequoia tree that's been around for 2000 years as being alive? And naturally you would say, well, I've been on this tree all my life, four days, and it hasn't done a doggone thing. Well, that's it, same case. You're a mayfly. If you're lucky, you'll live to be 100 years or more. 
but you're standing on an object that has been evolving since its birth four and a half billion years ago. And so I became so fascinated uh, with the earth. I wanted to know more about it. What naturally that took me beneath the sea. Now, if you drain the waters of the world's oceans and you look at what it looks like, look at this. This was a map published by National Geographic when I was in high school. And it shows you that the ocean floor is not just a big basin full of mud, but in fact, the largest mountain ranges are beneath the sea. It's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. It runs around our planet like the seam on a baseball, coming out of the Arctic, through Iceland, down through the Atlantic Ocean, makes a turn, goes into the Indian Ocean, crosses it, and enters the Pacific, and goes for a distance of 40,000 miles, 70,000 kilometers, before it comes aground in Baja, California. This giant mountain range, if you were to put it on an equal area map, this is a Mercator projection, which takes a sheet of paper and wraps it around the globe and projects, you would realize that the mid-ocean ridge covers a quarter of our planet, yet no one had ever gone down to the biggest feature on Earth until after astronauts had gone to the moon. So what I wanted to do, and I was lucky to be the first group of humans that went down and saw what was going along, along this great mountain range. We got in tiny submarines and we went down and we discovered that along this entire 40,000 mile mountain range, the earth is bleeding its blood. Now, when you cut yourself, blood comes out, it's warm and coagulates and it forms new tissue. But as you can see, when we got down in our submarines, it's bleeding at Earth's blood. This is molten lava coming out of the Earth and creating new skin. And it's all along this great mountain range where the Earth creates its outer skin. And that's led to this whole new theory called plate tectonics, sort of a fancy name. But what it's saying is that the Earth is made up of pieces, around 23 pieces. And those pieces are doing one of three things. Along this great mountain range, this 40,000 mile opening in the earth where it's bleeding its blood, that blood comes up because the plates are moving apart and they form new tissue. Constantly at this very second, there are tens of thousands of volcanoes under the ocean bleeding earth's blood. That tissue then moves away from its site of creation to where it runs into another plate. And there the ocean floor goes beneath it and it subducts and is re, uh, melted into the Earth's interior. And the continental part buckles and forms great mountain ranges. The Andes, the Himalayas, all the great mountain ranges on our Earth are caused by the collision of plates. And so I've been fascinated with understanding this whole process of plate tectonics. And literally we rewrote the geology books over the initial 10 years of exploring this great mountain range. But then something amazing happening at the same time, we were puzzled by the chemistry of the world's oceans. We knew that the ocean was salty. You just have to lick it to know that. But we didn't know why it had the kind of salt it had. We thought rivers must be doing it. We know rivers flow into the ocean. We had been taught in our, in our chemistry book, the process of the hydraulic cycle that water evaporates, forms a cloud, falls as rain, and on its way back to the ocean, it picks up material through erosion and weathering. In fact, you, you can't miss it. Look at the Mississippi, it's not blue, it's brown. And it's carrying all these chemicals back into the ocean. All the rivers of the world are dumping things into the ocean, but here was the mystery. When we analyzed what the rivers were bringing in, it was not the chemistry of the world's ocean. Something crazy was going on and we didn't know what it was. We knew that chemicals came in, but they strangely disappeared and new chemicals took their place, forming the ocean's chemistry. We couldn't do it. My, one of my undergraduate degrees was in not only geology, but in chemistry. We couldn't balance all the equations. And, but then one day, I'm driving my submarine along that mountain range and I come across these giant 
chimneys, and unbelievably large chimneys that were just belching out the ocean. If you'll notice these, what we call black smokers. And black smokers, I mean, I call them chimneys because they, they look like a chimney, but in fact, they weren't. When we came up to the chimneys, uh, we were seeing these giant black material coming out. In fact, I w there they are. So this is the, the discovery I made when I was driving along and I saw, it looks like a chimney to me. And I went up to it and I wanted to measure uh, its temperature to see how hot it was. My pilot wasn't too excited about that, but I said, no, no, let's get a little closer. And I stuck my thermometer in the chimney and it pegged off scale. In fact, when I pulled the thermometer out of the chimney, it had melted. In fact, I realized that the exiting temperature of the chimney was hot enough to melt lead. It was six, 750 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was, could have melted my porthole. But when we realized that what's happening, as you'll see in that one image, the water of the ocean is going down in cracks and getting heated by the magma chamber and then coming back up to form uh, the whole chemistry of the world's oceans. And we, uh, we discovered that this material, the entire volume of the world's oceans is going inside the earth and out every six to eight million years. And when we plug that into our equations, for the first time they balanced and we were able to explain the chemistry of the world's oceans. But that was nothing compared to the guy over my shoulder here. We found living around these chimneys, the craziest creatures I'd ever seen. Tube worms, tube worms that were 13 feet tall. And they, in this, we call them uh, tube worms because they, they were sticking out their lung. That, that red feathery thing is actually the lung of a worm, believe it or not. And it has a pint of human-like blood in it. In fact, living around these giant worms were giant clams. Now, I live here in New England, and I eat a lot of clams, but I don't think you're going to want to eat the clams that we found. These clams are a, almost a foot across and have human-like blood inside of them. And there they are. So these are giant clams living on the fresh lava flows. There's no mud. These clams are not in mud like the clams I go clamming for on Block Island. And like I say, when I opened the clam, it had human-like blood inside of it. But then get this, when we cut the clam open, it had no internal organs. It had no mouth, no gut, no digestive system like a normal clam. Its entire body had been taken over by a creature. That lower right-hand corner is what's called an extremophile, a bacterium that's inside the body of the clam that had figured out how to take poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas coming out of those black smokers and hot springs and fix carbon. And we found a whole nother system of life that lived not off the energy of the sun through photosynthesis, which we were taught in our biology book, but through a process called chemosynthesis. And those bacterium are able to replicate photosynthesis in the dark. So in a very short period of time, we threw out our geology book, we threw out our chemistry book, and then we threw out our, our, our uh, uh, biology book. So all three, geology, chemistry, and biology, all the books I'd read, they weren't right. So remember, science is a work in progress. But this then opened up a whole new field of exploration. We knew that life began in our ocean. But it wasn't until we found hydrothermal vents in these exotic creatures that we were able to know where it all began. Because the ocean is, the Earth's had oceans for billions of years, long before us, long before life. And then it created life in the oceans. But we now know that there are other oceans within our own solar system. So the question comes, are we alone? And the answer is, we're not. I'm confident all throughout our universe 
is life, intelligent life, perhaps more intelligent than us right now. But we also know that within our own solar system, within reach of our, of our spacecrafts, are the moons of Jupiter and Europa. And believe it or not, those moons have more water than we have. If you compare the amount of water that we have on Earth to the amount of water on the moons of Enceladus, of Saturn moon, or Europa, they have more water than we do. And you can see in this next illustration that comparison. So here you see what we have on Earth, that little blue. And to scale, these are the moons of Jupiter and Europa. Our ocean is 60 miles deep. Europa's ocean, the moon of Saturn, is 60 miles deep. And we're convinced that when we send probes there, we're going to find life. In fact, in the case of Enceladus, the, the, you have geysers erupting on the surface of Enceladus. Uh, so there's the ocean. There's the same volcanoes we got. We think they'll probably have the same hydrothermal vents. They probably won't have giant worms or giant clams, but they'll probably have somebody. And what we're thinking of is flying a spaceship through the geyser with our mouth open and see if we pick up the bacterium or the chemistry that's similar. So this is all going to take place within the next 20 years. In fact, your generation is going to make more discoveries in outer space and certainly even on our own planet than all previous generations combined. Your generation is the generation of explorers. So look around at one another and you shake hands with some of the future explorers. And that's what our educational program is all about wanting to involve you in this exciting, exciting adventure. It's just cool. I can't wait to have you join us. Megan? It's so inspiring to think about the, the work that we do can carry us to the bottoms of the oceans and solve mysteries there or all the way out into space and solve some of those similar mysteries along the way. Uh, I want to ask you a question about this year. It certainly turned a lot of us onto our heads to be creative about what school looks like, what expeditions look like. Uh, and you've, for your entire career, been really creative about what exploration and technology can allow us to do in the oceans. Will you share a few of the technologies that you've worked with and how we got well, it's, to it's the exploration model we use today? changed dramatically and fortunate just in time for us because we can do everything without leaving anywhere. But my journey beneath the sea began, let me give it, it was quite a while ago. It was in 1968. I began diving in deep diving submarines. And I spent 20 years, this is my favorite one. This is Alvin. Um, hi, Logan, how are you? Uh, this is my, was my favorite submarine for 20 years, Alvin. And it took me to the bottom of the ocean. It could go at the time down 12,000 feet which is 50% of the world's oceans is shallower than 12,000 feet. But I took another bathyscaphe called Trieste II, and I went down 20,000 feet. Now, here's the problem was getting to work. It took me six hours to get down to 20,000 feet in the morning. So I burned up my whole morning getting to work. And then it, I knew it was going to take me another six hours to get home. So that meant my daily commute to work was going to be 12 hours in these submarines. Well, that doesn't leave a lot of time at the office. So what I began to do, see, I'm, I'm dyslexic, and I'm very excited about being dyslexic because I think very differently. I see things people don't see. I imagine things people don't imagine. And so I began dreaming in my mind about a new way of exploring and I actually published it in 1981 in National Geographic magazine with a panda on the cover in the December issue. And here is the cartoon I published. And the concept was to have an out-of-body experience of somewhat like Avatar, where you, if you remember in the movie Avatar, where the person got in the, uh, the Avatar uh, creature, the Navi. Well, I wanted to have my own Navi, and I called it Jason 
Jason, in memory of Jason and the Argonauts. And that's the little white guy down on the bottom uh, shining its lights. And then it had a, a support vehicle called Argo. And the idea was that once you put the robot in the ocean, you don't have to bring it up. You send your spirit. It's So basically what we started doing a long time ago, and that's why we're not affected right now by our explorations because we move spirits and they can't get COVID-19. So we're able to move you through this amazing technology of telepresence. It's sort of like in Star Trek when they said, beam me down, Scotty. We can beam you down and they can beam me down from here. This is just a few minutes from my home. So I can come in here Turn this on and move my spirit to the bottom of the ocean, but I can also move your spirit to the bottom of the ocean. Now, the first time I ever used this technology to demonstrate there was a new kid on the block was to take on this guy, the Titanic. I wanted to do an expedition that everyone would really pay attention to. It was sort of cool finding hydrothermal vents, but most people ask me about the Titanic, even though I think this is my greatest discovery. I'll take credit for that one as well. But the idea was I could go after the Titanic because I didn't go down in Alvin uh, at crawling around at one mile an hour for a few minutes. I could put my robot Argo down and, and use it to make that great discovery. So that's what we did. We went out with our ship and we tested our new technology and were able to Put Argo in the upper left. That was my first Navi, and and that was my my first command center. I mean, I have to, to look at it. It's sort of two cans on a string back then, but it was good enough because I got it down and I didn't bring it up till I finally found the Titanic, found the boilers, and and then came back the next year with my first little prototype underwater robot called Jason Jr. In my cartoon, I talked about using a, a Jason, but we didn't have all the technology worked out. So I took a little miniature version of my future robot, Jason, called it Jason Jr., even though it came ahead of the parrot. And I put it on Alvin and I went down with it. So I mounted, you see that little blue thing on the front of Alvin? I went down and literally landed on the deck of the Titanic. I'd found it the year before with my robot Argo and then had it explore the outside, but then I had it actually go inside the Titanic, sending it down the grand staircase to get the interior of the Titanic, which really blew the world away. So this was this was quite a first a coming out party for my new exploratory technology. But you want to see what we're doing now. What we're doing now, I was able to take that image, that dream, that dyslexic dream of mine, and turn it into reality. And that's the Nautilus. That's the ship I have now. And it can do exactly what that cartoon shows you. So we have our ship. It's out at sea. But then we lower our robots and we then link them by way of a high bandwidth satellite link. So this is what we have now. So I have Hercules and Argus. They're my explorers. They're my novice. They send everything they have up to my command center, but then I put it on a satellite, send it to my inner space center at the University of Rhode Island Graduate School of Oceanography. And then from there out to what we call doctors on call. So we have a, a downlink site at Rhode Island, but then it they, they're, they're standing the same watches that we stand aboard the ship at the Inner Space Center. And at the Inner Space Center, they're able to command and control and direct everything that we're doing underwater. So let me show you Hercules. And that's my, that's my new robot. That's Hercules. That carries my spirit and I don't have to be in it because we're land animals. 95% of the human race live on less than 5% of earth because most of the rest of the place is uninhabited.
habitable. So we are able to beam our bodies wherever we want to go. And we've been doing it through this whole COVID-19, Zooming and WebExing. And that's just the beginning of being able to move your spirit. Within a few short years, you'll be at home and you'll be driving a, a, a robot, a, a Hertz Renner robot in the Serengeti and thinking you're there. That's the technology that we're now introducing across the board and why we're at sea, why we're able to continue what we're doing is because of that amazing technology of telepresence. But we also wanna do it to reach you. So the whole thing, the whole concept of our program is to explore the unknown, to go boldly go where no one has gone before on planet Earth, but then to take you with us. And we have, as Megan said right at the beginning, what we call our core of exploration. These are our team. And these are just a small number of our team. Each year, we take about 100 or more people on our expeditions as members of our core, as role models and mentors for the next generation of scientists and engineers and artists and authors. And we not only do STEM, we do STEAM. We add the arts, as you can see, through production that we're doing right now. And that's what we wanna do with you. So we want you to be a part of our expeditions. We have complete television production studios that National Geographic gave me at the Inner Space Center that make it possible to come and reach you anytime, anywhere. What's really cool about our exploration is we do it 24 hours a day. So it doesn't matter what time zone it is. Where we go, it's always dark. We always bring our lights. So it means you can involve your parents. You can involve your friends. You can do it 24 seven. The Nautilus leaves today and it'll be underwater 24 seven. And we want you to tune in and watch what we're doing, but look at the different ways we can do it. We have all sorts of different uh, formats of delivering this. We can do it on your laptop. We can do it on your television set. We can do it on your cell phone. And then you can become involved, ask questions, and then you can actually come on the act. We have young people like you. You have to be at least 15. Uh, but my daughter, Emily, who's right behind the curtain helping me direct this programming, she came out when she was 15. She's now 22. She's 23. Oh, my that's right. She, no, you're not 23 yet. It's Thanksgiving. So my daughter is helping me do this. She's into television production. She went to Ithaca College and majored in television production. So like I say, we have STEM and STEAM. So you know, in fact, show us a picture. I think we got a picture in there or two of Emily when she was on the Nautilus. You got that shot. I think it's the last, you know, there she is, upper center. That was when she first started going. And you have another, keep going through these images. These are the mentoring that we do on our expedition, taking people. We have an amazing, go to our website and see all the intern programs for teachers and students and artists and Everyone that comes with us, we take many, many each year. And then the Nautilus is basically a floating unit, a classroom. We have lectures going all the time. And so, uh, I th so show me the, show them the final image. That's my favorite. Show me the final image and then we'll start doing some questions and answers. There's our intern, keep marching through them. That's our intern program. And then we have another one. I, it's my the very last image in my in my deck there. You'll see all of the different folks that come and get involved in our program. You see that last one there? Boom, boom, boom. I think it's a perfect opportunity as they pull that up. Uh, we had a question from Zed about, do you need a PhD to be an explorer? And we know that there are a lot of different roles, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about them and that collage of some of the different people that have been on the ship. Overshade. Well, imagine a football team that only had 12 quarterbacks on the field or 11, whatever the number, 11. Would you win a game with 11 quarterbacks? Of course not. It would be pretty pathetic looking. 
So you need all the different positions filled on that team. You need people that block. You need people that can catch a ball and can punt, that can intercept. That's the core. The core of exploration has is just like a football team. I played football. I played college basketball. And you need all of those positions. You need everyone on them. In fact, if you go to our website and you see who's on watch, maybe one PhD is on watch. Commonly, no PhDs. And then you look up who they are. Do that. How did they get to where they got? How did they become a member of the core? Well, what they did is they followed their passion. And their passion, in my daughter's case, was in television production. Other people's are loved it. Mechanics, they love to tear things apart and put them back together. We need lots of people because we have to put our vehicles, have to go in the pit and get fixed. We're constantly having trouble. We had some really good ones this year where we had to do brain surgery on the fly. And that was not done by a PhD. That was done by an engineer. We have amazing production people. No, everyone can play on our team. There's there's no one out there that cannot play on our team. But you have to study. You have to follow your passion. You have to you have to do the your homework. And whatever kind of homework it is, or pick up a, a, a palette and paint, pick up a camera and shoot. We need every one of you in this game. And we, we, we involve everyone. So no, everyone can play. It's perfect. And so check out Nautilus Live and click the team page and you can actually check out a brand new series of videos that we made that'll introduce you to some of those different jobs and some of those different people if you're ready to follow up. Uh, next question I have, uh, let's pull one up. If you have questions for Dr. Ballard, drop them in the chat and we'll get them into the program. But this is from Margie on Facebook. And Margie wants to know, what do you think ocean exploration will look like in 20 years? What kind of technologies are you excited about? Oh, I, I'm I'm going to be here and it's going to all be robots. Now, the beauty of it is I'll think I'm there. That's what counts. But everything will be, there'll be ships with no people on them, bodies on them. Now, I like to draw the distinction between having your body out there and having your spirit out there. As I look at you right now, I don't see my body. I see a camera. So I'm not looking at my hands, and I, but, but I look at my hands, I say, what an amazing robot. I, I do this and my finger moves. But if you cut off my finger, you know, I got nine now. You can give me a new heart, you can, but you can't give me a new spirit. That's me. That's what makes me. The rest of me is a piece of amazing machinery. And there's machinery now that can, that can move faster than I can can see better than I can. We know eagles can see better than we can. We know dogs can smell better than we can. We're gonna be developing things that let us see like an eagle and smell like a dog. We're gonna be able to sense a world that we're literally blind and deaf, dumb and blind to. And that's the world that you're gonna be able to explore through the invention of new technologies. And so, yeah, I, I would rather see you like an eagle personally. <laughs> I want to see what an eagle sees because I know I can't see an infrared. I can't see in, in so many different wavelengths, but other creatures can, but now I can. So yes, I see the future as empowering the human spirit to do what the human body can't do. And particularly, think about it, I'm 78 years old. And this technology, I'm still in the game, kids. I'm still in the game, right at my prime thanks to this technology. Absolutely. Uh, so keep those questions coming in in the comments and we'll pull them in. I wanted to touch on something you mentioned just earlier. Uh, you are a major advocate for students with learning differences. Um, you have dyslexia. And I, I'm curious, I think a lot of students think that if you've made it to be an ocean explorer, you probably never had a hard time in school, which certainly isn't the case for me. Uh, I know it's not the case for you. What advice would you give to students who are maybe struggling with a difficult class or running into that big challenge? First, I want to talk to their teachers. You know, I want you to pick up a book, teacher, 
It's called the dyslexic advantage, not the dyslexic disadvantage. I remember I, I didn't know I was dyslexic because I'm 78 and the word didn't exist. I had trouble reading and I was tutored and I still have trouble reading if it's in your font. But if it's in my font, open dyslexic font, it frees up my mind, I read much faster. Every teacher should use, let students do their homework in open dyslexic font. It speeds up their brain, they read faster. And they should all read the book. See, the people that wrote the rules to education were dominantly non-dyslexics. So they wrote the rules. And so dyslexics struggle with those rules. If I wrote the rules, they would be dyslexic rules and you would struggle because we see the world very differently. We imagine it very differently. Our mind is built very differently. And I remember I was driving uh, from the university home one night and I on NPR heard about the book, The Dyslexic Advantage. I'm in my 60s now. And I said, that sounds like me. And I went home and I ordered it on Amazon. It came a couple days later. And I read the book, read the book without stopping. And tears came to my eyes because it explained me to me for the first time in my life. I understood why I was the way I am, why I'm unique and how I have a gift not a disadvantage, I have a gift of dyslexia. And it, I use it and I, I have a book wonderfully coming out, I'm, I'm pitching here, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> On Father's Day, my autobiography is being published by National Geographic, along with a one hour television special and a feature in the magazine explaining me to you. It's called Into the Deep. And it walks you through how I got where I got. Because I discovered I had to read twice as long. I had to study twice as hard. But what drove me was my passion. That's what drove me. Because I was determined to be Captain Nemo. That was my hero growing up. Why do you think I call it the Nautilus? It's named after my hero. And I didn't read the book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea at first. I watched the movie, 20,000 <laughs> Leagues Under the Sea. I learn visually. And it's through the visual world that I got to where I got. You know what's really cool? When I go down to the deep sea, it's black. I have to imagine it. I'll never forget when we found the Titanic in 1985 with our robots, Argo, we came back the next year with our Alvin. and we're going to see it through the porthole. And as we launched Alvin on its first dive in 1986, we had our own made. Everything stopped working. The sonar stopped working. The depth, everything wasn't working in the submarine. And the pilot's saying, you know, Bob, we don't know where we are. And I said, keep going. He said, we've lost tracking. Keep going. We landed in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere, there was no sign, Titanic. And he went, well, smarty pants, where's Titanic? There. And it was. That's because I was able to put all the data together in my mind and we came in on the Titanic. Gotcha. Try that, you non-dyslexics. Total darkness. And I formed an image in my mind. It's over there. And that's exactly where it was. I do it all the time. I look at all the data on all these dashboards. When I'm on it, I don't know if you have a shot of our new command center. Show it to them. If you have a shot of our new command center, it's dyslexic paradise. You stand in the middle of that puppy and you have 45 displays coming at you and you close your eyes 
and it all makes sense. It is an incredible advantage and being able to put those data all together in a big way is, is a real gift. So students, if you are challenging, keep going, keep going. If you, and have, if you have my gift, put it to use and read and learn the road to go down and the road not to go down. There are amazing roads to go down. Look at, look at who's dyslexic. Uh, uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, Richard Branson, uh, Picasso, uh, Einstein, uh, on the list. It's just exhausting list of people, but we tend to live out of the box. We don't go by their rules. We go by our rules. We form our own world, and I, I pulled it off, kids. Good luck. <laughs> You can too. We believe in you for sure. And in building this space that is inclusive and celebrates your talents. Uh, let's get to some more questions. This one is from Lucy, who is five. Uh, Lucy wants to know, Dr. Ballard, what is your favorite deep sea creature? Oh, it's the octopod, the hooded octopod, the Dumbo. I called it Dumbo when I first saw it. I was, I think, one of the first to ever see it. I was down 20,000 feet and I looked out the window and I saw what was supposed to be an octopus, but it wasn't acting like an octopus. It had these giant fins on its head. And instead of jetting like an octopus or a squid, it was swimming with its ears. I think you have a video if you somewhere in your library there of a of the hood. There it is. Look at that character. Gotta love it, you know? Swimming away, not with its it's with its, <laughs> you, you gotta love that critter, you know. And and wherever I go in the deep sea, I see this the hooded octopus. <laughs> I think it lives inside our vehicle and comes out when we. You gotta love that guy. I mean, oh, yeah, that was that's my favorite. <laughs> That's a great one. And all these Good. videos that we're sharing are available at nautiluslive.org. So check those out. Um, we definitely can uh, supply you with a lot of imagination and creativity. We have a question coming from Blue Hill, Maine about the cracks in the hydrothermal vents. What exactly is coming out of there? I know we sometimes have some confusion, black smoke. Is okay. it smoke? We're underwater. Tell us more. All right. So remember we have the plates. So the plates are pulling apart, some big cracks. When you pull the Earth's outer skin apart, it cracks. So it cracks and the crack goes down about a kilometer and it hits a magma chamber. It, and, then, and then when you drop the pressure, if you learn in your chemistry class, your PT curve, you'll learn that if you relief the pressure, that it's gooey in the Earth, it's plastic almost, but super hot. So there you are. So you've got, 1200 degrees temperature magma down there. And then when you pop it, you drop, it's, it's hot enough to be a liquid, but the pressure is keeping it from mobilizing. But as soon as you crack it and you drop the pressure, it mobilizes, it melts. And now that melt, that big wad of molten lava is called the asthenosphere. The lithosphere is the crusty part, the egg on the, sh on the, sh uh, the shell on the egg. But inside is the yolk of the earth, and that yolk is gooey, but it's not a liquid until you pop the pressure, and then it becomes a liquid, and now it's buoyant, and it comes up and it sits in a magma chamber, and then it feeds the, 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 the volcanoes that forming the tissue. Now what happens is water is going down that crack. Okay, you open it up, it's got the ocean on top of it, so water goes down the crack, carrying the minerals from the rivers, goes down and gets near the magma chamber and a whole series of chemical reactions take place. And it's sort of like, I'll trade you Batman for Superman or whatever. They, the, the, the ocean water gives up chemicals and, and they, the magma gives up chemicals and they change themselves. And that new fluid, it's hot, so it wants to go up. That new hot fluid comes up and it's, super hot. It's 750 degrees Fahrenheit. It's super hot. And then when it comes out of the ocean floor, the ocean floor water is very cold because 
water gets denser, the colder it gets till it hits four degrees centigrade. So you can count on water in the deep sea being just above freezing. So there's four degrees and you interject into it super hot water and the smoke isn't smoke. If you get, don't get too close. But if you look, it's micro minerals. It's little, those, that's not smoke. That black, if you got really close, right at the base of the opening, it's a clear fluid. But then it's called, it's called quenching. So when it goes from super hot to super cold, that smoke is minerals, micro crystals, and it's building chimneys of, get this, kids, copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold. In fact, that discovery has launched a new gold rush. And now the big issue that's going to be dealing with is companies want to mine those minerals. And the question is, can you do it safely? I would rather go and get dead ones that are deposited because there's no smoke, there's no tube worm. There's a, mostly uh, they're dead and carried away. And so the so a big controversy is developing now on should we mine all this copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold. There's also rare earths. So there's an amazing amount of minerals. But that black smoke are little crystals of of called pyrite, chalcopyrite, and hydrite and stalarite. Those are being fancy. Those are the minerals. They look like fool's gold. In fact, chalcopyrite is called fool's gold. It looks like gold. And in some cases, it has gold. So yeah, that's what you're seeing is it's not smoke. It's a clear fluid that gets quenched, precipitates out the minerals, fall back down. There it's it incredible how all the layers of the earth are connected here and all interacting with the ocean. The ocean can tell us so many things. Uh, I have another question. Someone said, when do you think we'll explore the whole ocean? Do you think that's possible? Uh, Absolutely. Talk to Absolutely. When do you think that'll be? What's gonna make We've been actually given a job that's sort of cool. Uh, the Nautilus in its core. Why do I call the Nautilus's team the core of exploration? Very easy. I was born in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. And I was raised on the Lewis and Clark expedition. When a Napoleon pick, picked a fight with England and he lost and they said pay up and he had to pay a war debt to England. So Napoleon came to, to President Jefferson and said, have I got a deal for you? I'll send you the Louisiana Purchase, which is a big central part of the United States, not owned by uh, us, but owned by the French. And they said, I'll sell you the Louisiana Purchase for 21 million bucks, which back then was a fair amount of change. And Jefferson went to Congress, said, ah, oh, we don't care about that. You know, sound familiar? And so the president said, I don't care. I'm going to buy it. And he went and bought the Louisiana Purchase. And then he went to two guys, Lewis and Clark, and said, I need you guys to go out and find out what, what we bought. And they mounted this historic expedition. And, and we all and, and we know that the Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the United States of America. And as we colonized it, we changed the whole economy of the United States. Well, the same thing happened when President Reagan picked up a pen not 21 million bucks, at the price of a pen, signed the Declaration Law of the Sea that America owns 200 miles off its shores, and we own vast amounts of real estate off Alaska, off the East Coast, off the West Coast, Gulf Coast, and all of the islands, the Hawaiian islands, the Guam, we own so many islands in the Pacific that when you add it all up, it doubled the size of America again. And our job, We've been given the job. We just won this big competition. We put together a heck of a team to, to do the second Lewis and Clark, but we're not calling it the Lewis and Clark. And we're not calling it the core of discovery. That's what he called his team. We're calling ours the core of exploration. And I was able to declare, because I was running the show, that 55% of our core would be positions of authority held by women. 
in positions of leader, still 45%. I use the college population. I defend myself. That's the college population, 55% women, 45% men. So I wanted the same ratio. And then I said, I want every face. Maybe if you can go back to that image of our core, you're going to see your face on the core. I want every person in this country, every face in this country is on our core. I think that's cool. Absolutely. So Dr. Ballard, as we're wrapping up with some of our time here today with you, I'm curious what message you would give to students. Certainly there are so many great opportunities to join our core, and that includes watching on Nautilus and uh, you know, getting involved in our internship program down the road or some of our other programs. But what message would you give to students who have been inspired today and they think they may want a career like yours uh, as they take off into their into the world? What would you say to them? The key is to follow your passion. It's your driving engine. I got knocked down many, many times as a dyslexic. And you get down there, you lay down for like a prize fighter, gets knocked out. He says, you know, if I lay here, they won't hit me anymore. But they get up. I got up because my passion said, get up. And I also learned that failure is the greatest teacher you will ever meet. Failure. You don't avoid failure. You embrace it and learn from it. When you get knocked down, and you will get knocked down. And like I say, I've been clobbered numerous times. It was my passion to be Captain Nemo, a silly, crazy passion that got me up and got me the Nautilus. I love it. A great message for all of us. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to get to uh, speak with you and we if you didn't get to your question today, everybody tuning in, we are planning to host more events like this and we hope you'll join us for those. In addition, a great way to join in the conversation with the team and meet more of our role models like Dr. Ballard is to watch on Nautilus Live as we take off tomorrow for an expedition off of Southern California, uh, looking at the biodiversity of these areas, all the types of animals and life that live here, uh, Rocky Hills, Rocky Hills, uh, Rocky Mountains just off the shore in this new part of America that we've never ever seen before. And you can be there with the power of telepresence live, experiencing it all right along our side and asking your questions. So stay tuned for some more Q and A's uh, that'll be part of that expedition. And if you like today's uh, program, know that the next program of this style is one where we explore some of those passions and think about how science and engineering art and creativity all come together because everyone who loves the ocean certainly isn't a scientist. And there's a lot of ways to tell that story. And that uh, program will be on Monday and you can check it out on nautiluslive.org to see that creativity in science, art and tech program that's coming up. So it's my absolute pleasure to talk with you. Thank you, Dr. Ballard. And we'll see all of you exploring soon with Nautilus.